So um, I'm going to uh, tell you something today different than you'll probably hear in the entire conference. I'm going to tell you the ways to fail. How many of you are uh, entrepreneurs in the audience? All right. um, you will probably encounter every one of these, so I just thought I'd let you know what they look like, because I personally did most of them myself. Um, as, the, uh, as was mentioned, I did eight startups in 21 years, uh, but half of them failed. Half of them. And two of them left craters so deep, I think they have their own iridium layer. They'll be digging up 65 million years from now as well. Uh, but in addition to telling you the six ways to fail at a startup, I thought I'd also tell you how to get it right. So if you're an entrepreneur, um, and by the way, if you're an entrepreneur, these are the three books you might want to have. Uh, uh, business Model Generation, uh, Alexander Osterwalder's uh, work I'm going to be talking about. Um, my text in the middle, Four Steps to the Epiphany. And one of my students, Eric Reese, who's now the pioneer of the Lean Startup movement, has a book coming out. Uh, those three should be the books on your shelf. But if you're an entrepreneur, at least for me, I started with a vision. I believed. I had passion. I wanted to make something happen that only I saw and believed if I could just get it done, the world would change. And so I knew what needed to be done. I was a visionary. I, this was my idea. Let's go do it, and let's start a company. And within that passion, I have a vision. Let's go do it. Let's start a company are embedded not only the seeds of success, but also the seeds of failure. Because here are the six ways to fail when you're a passionate entrepreneur driving to build that company. Failure point one. It's my vision, and I know exactly who the customer is. Why? Because it's my vision. And I might have talked to my friends, or maybe you know people in my dorm room or someone else, but I know. And because I know who the customer is, I obviously know exactly the product they need. I know the customer, I know the product. And implicitly in all that, though I maybe don't even articulate it, I know the problem they have. And by the way, if we build it all and we kind of get it wrong, don't worry. We have plenty of time to fix it after we ship every possible feature I could think about putting in the product. Does any of this sound familiar to anybody? Yeah. Um, and all I need to do is execute the plan I wrote down when I started this company, and maybe investors have given me money for the plan. So all I need to do is execute this plan and use large company tools, which I'll share with you in a second, to go execute the plan. What's a large company tool? Anybody ever see this product introduction model? Have a concept, a seed round, product development, alpha test, beta test, first customer ship. Anybody ever see this before? It's kind of like um, in Silicon Valley, our joke is the, you know, the waiters can draw this on the napkins. And, and in fact, uh, some of my students used to remind me, uh, well, uh, we're waiters because we used to be dot-com CEOs. Um, so this is the canonical model that for 40 years, if you would have drawn this for your investors, they would have said, yes, that's exactly the model. You have a concept, you get a seed round, you go into product development, you have alpha test, beta test, you launch the product, first customer ship. And if you drew this diagram, I will contend we now understand that this diagram is the leading cause of startup death. Because implicitly in here are two assumptions that I will guarantee you are wrong. The minute you draw this diagram, you are saying, well, startups are just an execution problem. That's all they are. I know who the customer is. I know what their problem is. So let's get to work, and let's hire engineers, and let's start coding or start building hardware. We're done. Execute. And what are we executing? Well, whatever our vision was on day one in that spec, every possible feature is going to go into that product. And when we're done, 
we'll just stand back and the money will fall at our feet because that's how it works. At least it works in the movies that way. Social network? Must be. And by the way, they go to Harvard, right? And then drop out. That seems to be the story. It turns out, if you follow this old model, you would be hiring your marketing people. While product development is creating the product, they'd be you know, creating marketing materials and they'd hire a PR agency and they'd create a demand and start you know, branding the product. And if you follow this diagram as well, in alpha and beta test, you would be hiring a VP of sales who'd be working to a sales plan and hiring a sales staff and then they'd build the sales organization and they'd know exactly what to do because there's a revenue plan attached to your business plan. It says so right there. VP of sales knows exactly what to do. And if you hire biz dev people, you know, I still don't know what they do, but um, if you hired biz dev people, I think they're supposed to do deals for first customer ship. And if you're an engineer, you know exactly what to do. If you do a formal process, you write a market requirements document and spec all the features, You'll go into waterfall development, you'll hire a QA team, a tech pubs team, and when you launch, you'll have a perfect 1.0 release that has every possible feature you could cram in. It's probably late, but everything's there. The problem is, is that this diagram, this product introduction diagram, comes from large companies. It's a great process for introducing your second, third, fourth, or 15th version. If you were doing Microsoft Word version 47, this is the perfect diagram. But you're not in a large company. Startups are not smaller versions of large companies. This is a big idea. In the last five years, we've begun to appreciate that we've been managing startups like all they were or smaller versions of Microsoft, Google, IBM, Facebook, when in fact they're not at all. A startup, now you're going to get a new definition. A startup is a temporary organization. First part of the sentence. Temporary organization. You don't want to remain a startup forever. Unless you're in the life sciences business, there's nothing there is no such thing as a 12-year-old startup. You're a two-year-old startup attached to a 10-year-old failure. Right? It's a temporary organization. You eventually want to become a large company. But it's, what does the startup do? Okay, I get it's temporary. It's designed to search. Oh, okay. A startup is a temporary organization designed to search. Well, search for what? Search for customers or revenue or... Actually, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. Now we have a definition of what it is you're supposed to do when you get up in the morning. Except the only problem is some of you might be going, what's a business model? Because I have to tell you, now that I teach, you get three professors in a room, and you used to get ten definitions of what a business model is, which was really no help if you were an entrepreneur. So I'm going to define what a business model is, but let me just point out, startups need their own tools different from those that are used in large existing companies. Another big idea. Venture capital and technology entrepreneurship is at best 50 years old. And what happened in the first 50 years is world-class investors basically took the tools that were familiar to them from business school and overlaid them on a new class of companies, which were startups. They took everything they knew and said, gee, that worked for large companies, worked for when I went to business school, let's use those in startups. And we now know, while profitable for the investors, it's probably not the most efficient way to build a startup. And so we need to be thinking about what tools we do need to have. So why is that? Well, if you really think about what a large company does in steady state mode, a large company executes 
known business models. You hire and staff and plan and execute based on sustaining innovation. We have a process that works. We're going to hire another 1,000 people to open 10 more stores, or we're going to ship more of the same product, or we might ship different versions of the same product. But large corporations hire, staff, plan, and execute known business models. And here's the kicker. Startups search for unknown business models. Big idea. Every one of you who's an entrepreneur is an explorer, is an artist. Accountants don't run startups. Innovators and explorers run early stage startups. So if the goal is to search for a business model, how do we do that? And as I said, what the heck is a business model? So this guy named Alexander Osterwalder a couple years ago said, look, there's 5,000 definitions of business model. Why don't I just make mine? And here's how to describe any company in nine boxes. And I have found his business model definition probably the most useful for an entrepreneur because he put it in a book with pictures. It's a joke, but it is. It's a, gr it's a great book, and it has pictures, and so I could understand it. Um, and I find my students kind of understanding it pretty easy as well. He said, any company can be described like this. First component of a business model is who are your customers? What's the customer segment? Who are you serving, and what jobs do they want you to do for them? Well, kind of interesting. I guess I need to know that if I'm a startup. The next part is, what value proposition are you offering them? And a value proposition is a $10 word for what product or service are you building that these people could use. And do, they re and do that customer segment you define really care? How you will deliver the product to them? What sales channel or distribution channel are you going to use? Customer relationships. How will you create end user demand? If you're a web company, this is all about SEO or SEM. If you're selling physical goods, it might be PR and advertising and trade shows. Revenue streams. Eventually, even if you're on the internet, you need a profitable business model. Is this a two-sided model where you'll be getting hundreds of millions of users and monetizing them um, through advertising? Is this a single-sided market where you're actually selling a product and getting revenue on day one? What are the key resources you need? What assets are essential? Is it engineering talent? Is it manufacturing? Is it some IP, intellectual property or patents? Are there some key activities that you need to do that are special? Is it manufacturing in China? Is it running a data center more efficiently than anybody else? Do you need any key partners or suppliers? Apple's iTunes model would never have worked without Steve Jobs' ability to convince partners to leave their common sense at home and hand them their wallets. Gosh knows how he pulled that off. But again, there's an example where partners for content were critical. And then finally, what's the cost structure? What's the expense side of your business? If you add all these up, you truly have a business model for your startup. And this is a great paper exercise on a whiteboard. And you could draw it out, and you can actually download this. It's called the Business Model Canvas on the web. And you could sketch out your business model. I find this an incredibly helpful exercise. But once you do that, you still have a whole set of hypotheses. I love the word hypotheses. It sounds important, doesn't it? Hypotheses sound important. And in fact, I use it when I teach at Stanford and Berkeley because those people pay a lot of money to go to school and they could tell their parents, I've learned about hypotheses. But actually, this is what it means. Even after you sketch out all your hypotheses, they're just guesses. And so you're left with a canvas, which are great now. Gee, I now know I have a business model. I know what it looks like. But they're just guesses. And so the question now is, if you believe that what a startup is about is searching for a business model, so the question is, so how do we search? What is it that we do? 
And gee, if you've built startups before, you know, oh, you go out and you talk to a lot of people and you kind of talk and you meet and you do and you deal and you, but what's the process? Well, you go out and you talk and you do, but what's the process? And I have to tell you, after 20 years of being an entrepreneur, I didn't have much of a process. I just kind of knew what worked and didn't, but there was nothing to read in any of the literature, in any of the business books or any of the, uh, anything I could find other than great war stories from successful entrepreneurs. So I put together a process which kind of was based around this one idea. Even after you do the business model design and business model canvas, it's really hard for an entrepreneur to deal with, but there are no facts inside your building. They're just your opinions. There are no facts. Even if you're a domain expert, there are no facts inside your building, so get the heck outside. Huge concept. If you're spending hours in system planning meetings, or days or weeks, polishing the spec and making sure it's formatted correctly and it's in the right font, way too much waste of time. It turns out a process we're going to talk about in a couple minutes, customer development, is now the process to search for a business model. And the business model canvas, this diagram, which summarizes all the components, is the way you could keep score of your progress in searching for a business model. And certainly if you're on the web, mobile apps, or cloud, the way you engineer the product is now with agile development. So the three, these three components, business model design, keep score, customer development, the process, and agile development, agile engineering, the way to build the product, kind of make up this whole new theme of what the lean startup is about. Let me give you a couple of examples, or just a brief overview of customer development, and then a couple of examples. Customer development, the founders get outside of the building. It's a four-step process. The first step, customer discovery, simply says, all you have on day one are a series of untested hypotheses you might be passionate about. So why don't you get out of the building and try to see whether anybody else other than you shares that vision. Step two, customer validation says, that's great, you found some people. Now let's see if right now they will buy a minimally viable product. That is the minimum feature set. Can you get an order or use or something to happen now? And what's really interesting between step one and two is this feedback loop that's now been labeled the pivot. The pivot simply says, most of the time, you will be wrong. But instead of creating a crisis, we will simply accept that startups fail more often than they succeed, and we will integrate that into the normal part of doing business in a startup, one of the key differentiators between execution in a large company where failure is a lack of competence, whereas in a startup, failure is a normal part of the learning and discovery process. Let's see how this works. Customer discovery. Even though you've written your business plan and you might have even gotten some angel funding and you're here at this conference, stop selling and get the heck out of the building and start listening. Test your hypotheses and do this with continuous discovery. And this is done by founders. You cannot like hire somebody like a VP of sales or some third party group. You personally have to hear this news yourself. And what you are doing is going back to the business model diagram, this canvas, and testing all the hypotheses. Test everything you believe about the channel, about customers, about every one of these boxes. And what you're testing, besides all that, is what's the minimum features I could ship that someone would be excited about? Not what every possible product feature I could think of Anybody could do that. It's easy to make up a wish list of the maximum feature set. What you're really interested about is what, what's the minimum amount of work 
that people would grab out of your hands and either pay for or use day one. And you're really trying to understand whether you get orders or how much you could learn or feedback or even fail out of that minimum feature set. Because the worst thing that could happen to a startup engineering team is ship a product after 15 months of work and then find out that customers didn't want 90% of what you built. Startups usually create a ton of waste. This is, in fact, a way to figure out how to be efficient about what you're going to build. The other key idea is the pivot. It's kind of the heart of customer development. In a normal startup, if you are simply executing a revenue plan, there will come a board meeting, I will almost guarantee you, where you don't make the plan. Anybody ever do that? Anybody ever not make a plan? Congratulations. Um, because what unfolds after you don't make a plan is, is so stylized, it's like a Japanese no play, in that the VCs kind of shake their head in the first meeting, you don't make the plan. At the next meeting, they arch one eyebrow at the CEO. At the third meeting, you open the boardroom door, and no one is sitting next to your VP of sales. And in fact, the stench of death is in the room. The next board meeting, you open the door, and you're astonished how the VCs pull this off. There's a flaming sword dangling over the VP's sales head, and just as you're about to say something, in a puff of smoke, he disappears. And next board meeting, there's a new VP of sales, like nothing happened. This process might iterate a couple of times because the new VP of sales looks at the old strategy and says, well, that was pretty dumb. I would never make that mistake, and so changes the strategy for sales in the company. But basically, the way we iterate today in a startup is we assume that we should be executing per the plan. See, that plan was written by the hand of God. There is no possibility it could be wrong. So every time a startup makes a mistake, it's a crisis that deserves some executive losing their job. I will contend that's just a misreading by investors for the last 50 years of the nature of how a startup differs from a large company. In a large company, if you're a VP of sales in an existing business and you don't make the plan, with all due respect, you're an idiot. It was a known job spec. There were known customers. There were known markets. You have failed, and that deserves a crisis. In a startup, we're searching a whole series of unknowns. We should just have a normal process that encompasses those failures and allows us to change rapidly. This allows us, this pivot, to be fast, agile, and opportunistic. Jerry, do I have time for an example? Can I give an example? So this is nice theory, but if you're an entrepreneur sitting here, you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does this really look like? Because, you know, thanks for the class, and, you know, you just got like two semesters worth in about 20 minutes. But l let me show you what it really looks like. So I teach this as a class. What you're going to see are students who are not only taking this class, but have three or four others going on at the same time. And just keep that in mind when you see these slides. So this is an eight-week class from an idea to a business. They not only have to come up with an idea, they not only have to build the product, but they have to get orders. And the students we have are anywhere from internet to autonomous robotic vehicles. In fact, the first example I want to uh, show you is a, a team that built a robotic weeding machine. This get out of the building stuff, they talked to 75 customers in eight weeks. Their initial plan, these are all their slides, was to build a large-scale mower and agriculture weeding machine. Think of it as a John Deere tractor with robots. You know, they were, they were gonna mow lawns with you know, no human beings and they thought that would be very cool. And we went, well, okay, go ahead and try that. And so they got out of the building. In the first couple weeks, they did 20 interviews, six site visits. You wouldn't believe there are farms in Silicon Valley, you'd be right, but one valley over, Central Valley is some of the richest farm country in the United States. And so they interviewed a whole series of farmers on the top and a whole a series of people who needed um, lawns mowed, golf courses, 
uh, institutions, parks, etc. And they were trying to understand, is there a business for this robotic mower kind of a business, or might there be some business for weeding? And their first business model canvas looked like this. They put up all their hypotheses on day one. And the most interesting box to look at is the one on the right. They thought really their business was going to be mowing, and maybe there'd be some interest from farmers. But we made them put down all their hypotheses. Tell me about the customer. Tell me about the key features of the product. Tell me about the channel. They were going to sell through lawn mowing dealers and maybe agricultural dealers. Their revenue was going to come from an asset sale. They were going to sell the equipment. Keep that in mind. After two weeks, they realized, you know what? There's really no business in mowing. Our business is the 100 to 1 labor reduction cost selling to organic farmers who have to hand pull weeds out of large fields in California. Well, that's kind of interesting. But we said, you know, guys, if all you do is kind of do this on paper and tell me that your machine might work in the lab, you'll get a gentleman's B+. Plus. And of course, given over, being overachievers, they said, well, that's not good enough. What would we have to do to get an A? I said, well, you'd have to build the robot. <laughs> they said, Steve, do you understand? It takes years to build a autonomous whatever. I said, yeah, too bad. 100-hour <laughs> week. They built the carrot bot in one week. One week. They took it out to the field and used it. So they had a hand push it, used it to identify weeds versus carrots and had a high-powered DARPA laser to kill those. And I thought they were going to kill somebody's pet while they were doing this, shooting the weeds. Um, and so the next couple of weeks, they updated their business uh, model canvas. They decided, hey, our target is organic farmers. We're going to do weeding service. And it's a, still a direct sale. Um, and we still have some issues about IP and technology. And so they still started to kind of iterate, um, now believe they understood that their, business, that their customer segment is mid to large organic farmers. Yes, they were convinced it was a direct sale. They still had some issues about technology and IP. Um, and then they went out to the World Ag Expo. World Agricultural Expo happened to be um, going on at the same time in the class. They interviewed uh, 10 uh, potential customers and realized that these customers wouldn't prefer to buy equipment. They'd rather like buy a service, a weeding service. And so now they realize that their business might be direct service with equipment rental. And they solve some of the technology problems and then finally decided that their business model was by charging by the acre with a modifier according to weed density. Now, I only just go through this set of business model canvases because this team, oh, this team, eight weeks, 75 customers, built a prototype, all while taking three other classes, but had a structured customer development and business model canvas to guide their work. Do we have time for one more example? Or should I? All right, let me give you another example. This is hard work. We had another team called Personal Libraries. This was a PhD student at uh, Stanford who had three years of work on this product, which was essentially um, uh, integrating the ability to organize and share thousands of digital papers. He thought this was a real problem. And for him, it was, because he was a researcher working on it for three years. Um, but he assumed that there would be lots of other people. And so his team decided to build a company around this for, for the class called Personal Libraries. And they put together what they called the Invincible Business Model version 1.0, that their customer segments were going to be researchers, lawyers, and scientists. Their revenue stream was affiliate program fees. Um, licensing, subscription models, and the value proposition was important and organized thousands of papers. So here's what they did. They got out of the building. They did 100 plus interviews, extensive surveys. They talked to over 800 people in surveys. They actually ran Google AdWords campaigns to drive people to this product, which was up and going. They did a complete review of competitors. They did market sizing. They uh, had 50 people, not them, blogging about the product. And they were actually connected on six social networks. They did usability tests, 
tests with user.com, incredibly cheap way to see how people actually interact with your product, and they did rapid iteration. And so here's what they found. Good, they could get subscriptions. Their pipeline would optimize. The web listens. Bad. Their entire customer base were academics. With all due respect to the people in the room, academics are cheap. Um, and our advice was, run away from this customer as fast as possible. They don't want to spend money and will incur infinite support and infinite cost. Um, and so they realized that their margins would be negative for the next four years if they decided to pursue this market. And the adjacent market, electronic content management, at least to them for the purpose of this class, was boring. So they decided to actually completely pivot out of this business and come up with another business model. Um, they were going to take uh, trusted advice to upwardly mobile professionals, and they started making archetypes of who those professionals would look like. And so here's what they did. Now, this is all within eight weeks. They did another 40 interviews. This time, they did about 400 people on the surveys. They did, they did landing page tests, market research, uh, more in-depth research, did revenue analysis, and built two prototypes. Uh, and they refined the personas of who they thought the customers were. Uh, here's another example of what we made them do to say, OK, if these are your customer segments, we really need to drill down on archetypes and tell us who they are, demographics, traits, motivations, budgets, et cetera. And so that was their kind of um, second attempt at a business model. Um, and so they thought, OK, there's version 2.0. But here's what they found. There was a lot of interest. Uh, they, in, terms of, in the middle of the class, they ranked number six on Google for Stanford admission books. They didn't even have one, which was pretty good. Uh, they had high conversion, 43%. Uh, they addressed needs of a market. But bad, they were missing features, which we knew. Uh, and they'd have to spend a lot of money fighting the SEO battle to actually get ranked high enough. So here's where they ended up. Um, Trusted Advice 2.0 was protection against SEO uh, uh, spammers. They had a whole series of experiments of what they wanted to do next. And here was their uh, final business model canvas. Uh, and what they learned was uh, potential for disruption, focus on big markets. Um, so I just wanted to give you a view of a different way to think about pursuing the startup process. To me, as I said, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for repeatable and scalable business model. And as entrepreneurs, I think what we've been missing for the first 50 years are our own tools, our own, designed to optimize that search. I think we're just beginning with the work at Berkeley and others to start inventing some of those tools. And I've shared with you Two of them today. Business model canvas to kind of keep score of your progress, and the customer development method, which is the actual process of how you do that work. So um, thank you very much. If you want some more detail, I write a blog called steveblank.com. Um, you'll see more stuff on this than you uh, ever would want to see in your life. So uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs>